Hello, my name is Dr. Christina Parks. I received my PhD in cellular and molecular biology right here in the state of Michigan from University of Michigan Medical School. And um, so I'm very well versed in the science of both these mRNA gene therapy vaccines, this kind of technology, as well as what a vaccine is designed to do in the body, what it can do, what it can't do, and the fact that this is extremely complex science that has been oversimplified in the media to basically take away our freedom of choice. What I want to address today in this limited time is the fact that vaccine requirements and mandates are based on the faulty assumption that the vaccines in question prevent transmission of the pathogen, right? Does the vaccine for DTaP prevent transmission? No. Does the vaccine for flu prevent transmission? No. Does, do the vaccines for COVID prevent transmission? No. In fact, they were never designed to do that. All right, so you're asking, what about this 95% effectiveness? If you look at those clinical trials, they do not say that they prevent transmission. They expressly say that they're measuring whether they um, attenuate symptoms. So they're 95% effective based on their clinical trials at attenuating symptoms for the first variant, which is essentially gone in our population. Right now, the predominant variant is the Delta, and um, CDC Director Walensky basic, basically said that these vaccines have no ability to prevent infection by and transmission of the Delta variant. So our policy needs not to be built on the hope of what we think something we want it to do, but what the data actually tell us. So do these viruses prevent, the, I mean, do the vaccines prevent the virus from infecting and uh, replicating in the nose and nasopharynx? No. They've only been shown to prevent that replication in the lungs. They're different. The mucosa is very different than the lungs. It's very different than the blood. You inject it to the blood. You make antibodies in your blood. The virus isn't infecting your blood. It's infecting your mucosa, and you don't produce any IgA to neutralize it. In fact, recent studies have shown that the vaccinated, especially with the Delta variant, and the unvaccinated have similar amounts of virus in their nose and throat. In Barnstable, Massachusetts, the CDC tracked an outbreak of 469 cases of COVID. 74% occurred in fully vaccinated, and four out of five of those hospitalized were vaccinated. All right, so maybe they are mandating this because they just didn't know with the COVID. And so my main complaint is with our health agencies and the CDC who basically know better and are misleading the public. So let's look at DTaP, which the scientists and the CDC have known since 2014 that the acellular pertussis vaccine does not prevent people from getting infected with the pertussis bacteria and passing it to others. In fact, it was never designed to do that. The vaccine was designed to neutralize the pertussis toxin. Pertussis, we know it as whooping cough. It can be fatal for children under six months. So neutralizing this toxin saves lives, all right? I'm not going to debate that. But what it doesn't do is neutralize the bacteria. So what happens is fully vaccinated children go to daycare, they pick up that bacteria, and they come home and they give it to their newborn brother or sister. They get deathly ill, and they go to the hospital. Hopefully, our medical professionals are able to save them. But who do they blame? Now the CDC is blaming anti-vaxxers for the limitations of this vaccine design. I suggest that they be transparent and tell parents that although it is preventing severe disease in their children, it is not preventing transmission because we have created a whole class of asymptomatic pertussis carriers who are increasing the disease. Now, the old DTP vaccine that many of you who are my age or older got did prevent transmission. When we switched to the safer a cellular virgin, they knew that it was never designed to pre prevent transmission. It was safer, it had less adverse events, but pertussis um, cases have gone through the roof. There's a resurgence in pertussis because of the design of the vaccine, and the vaccinologists know this, they're trying to address it, and so we cannot mandate that something that does not prevent transmission. All right, what about the flu vaccine? Well, they have shown that basically it, there's no difference, there's no statistical difference if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, whether you get the flu or not. But 
it's even worse because although that first year it is somewhat effective, it's about 65% effective at preventing um, symptoms in you, after that it actually has negative efficacy. And I want to address this because it's very important. Vaccines are made to a specific variant, and when that variant mutates, the vaccine no longer recognizes it. And so it's like you're seeing a completely new virus, and be because that's so, you actually get more severe symptoms when you're vaccinated against one variant, and then it mutates, and then your body sees the other variant. So there's the potential, and the science shows that, in fact, with the flu, if you get uh, vaccinated in multiple years, you are more likely to get severe disease, you are more likely to have more viral replication, and you are more likely to be hospitalized, both in adults and in children. We are seeing the same thing in COVID with the Delta variant. And so we are mandating that people get a vaccine that could actually make them more sick when they're um, exposed to the virus. In fact, this week, a paper came out, and what it showed is that with this Delta variant, when you're vaccinated, your body makes antibodies that are supposed to neutralize the virus. But they were supposed to neutralize the old variant. When they see this new variant, what they're doing is they're actually, the antibodies are taking the virus and helping it infect the cells. All right, that science was just published this week. We need to be looking at the science and we need our policy to reflect the science and we also need it to reflect our rights. Okay. And so, um, as a PhD who knows the science, I'm in the category of the most vaccine hesitant group. Yes, PhDs are the most vaccine hesitant, followed by people who have less than a high school degree because they know what they don't know and they don't trust their government. And many people, the other group that is very vaccine hesitant are African Americans. 70% of African Americans have not taken this vaccine. Why? Because they don't trust their government. Do they have reason not to trust their government? Well, between the um, years of 1930 and 1970, the CDC conducted the Tuskegee experiment where they took un, um, untreated males with syphilis and they refused to treat them. Even after antibiotics became available, they still did not treat them and they did not tell them that they had syphilis. They told those people that they were there to secure their health and they did not secure their health, they abused them. You say, well, that was in the past, although I don't think 1970 was that long ago. Well, in 2012, whistleblower William Thompson came forward and said, we published a study that said MMR does not cause autism, but we lied. In fact, we shredded data that showed that when black boys are vaccinated on time, they have increased rates of autism diagnosis, and we shredded it and we left it out of the paper. As an African American and a PhD, I want to ask each of you, are we going to exclude 70% of African American people from the workforce and from education? Right, my ancestors did not work this hard. I come from a family that worked very hard and I'm very aware that my privileges are dependent on the work of my grandmother and my great grandmother and I have great respect for these people that put me where I am, and yet you're telling me that my son will not be able to be educated if based on the history of African Americans in this country that he doesn't want to be vaccinated? All right, so I will leave you with that question. Who are we going to exclude from the workforce? Are we going to continue with discrimination and segregation in the United States of America? Thank you.